Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> I'd like to invite uh, Joshua Atkinson up now to read the inspirational reading for this morning. This is from a Paul Solomon reading, and it asks a wonderful question. It says, what would bring cosmic consciousness? It would come only through awakening, through realizing that all that is needed, and indeed all that there is, lies within yourself and not in another's heart. As long as you value identity, personality, or self, you find that barrier between self and the expression of the divine. And that moment that identity is lost, then shalt thou become him. In that moment shall you express cosmic consciousness and his presence on this earth plane. And in that moment shall the scales be lifted from your eyes, and you shall observe the second coming of the Christ. Now understand these teachings and attune self to self. Release identity. Place your value on these things that are of value, lest true value be taken away. All right, I'm going to play a song for you now. Um, on the piano, and uh, this is a song that I played for my wife Marty when she was in hospice, and it reminds me of her because of its simple grace and its simplicity. And uh, as I play this song, I would suggest that you bring to mind anyone that you're aware of who has passed over, uh, whoever comes to your mind. Thank you. 
1975, I was taking classes in Wayne, New Jersey, with a man by the name of Don Yacht. And Stephen Haslam's parents, Eileen and Herb Haslam, were taking classes there as well. Now, I was out of a job. And so, uh, well, uh, Paul Solomon came to town, and uh, we were all <clears throat> very taken by him. And I was out of a job, so Eileen and Herb Haslam gave me the gift of my first ILC class. Shortly after that, they suggested to their son, Stephen, to go down to Virginia Beach. I had moved down to Virginia Beach already, and they thought he might feel a kinship with the Fellowship of the Inner Light and the teachings of Paul Solomon. So he came down to Virginia Beach and Paul Solomon recognized Stephen's uniqueness in his ability to serve and his ability to love. And he became Paul's apprentice. Stephen trained and worked with Paul Solomon from 1976 to 1992. <laughs> Together with his wife, Murr, he worked as pastor of the Virginia, this Virginia Beach Fellowship Center. Today, Stephen works with Rob Pennington in the Houston-based management consulting training firm, Resource International, taking the emotional intelligence inherent in inner light consciousness into the workplace. Stephen and Rob are recipients of the highest evaluations from ExxonMobil every year for 34 years for their multi-day training successful work relationships. Stephen and his parents, Eileen and Herb, have a special place in my heart. And um, today, you'll hear Stephen's unique experience with Paul Solomon on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> we hope. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Yes, everyone. It is my parents' fault that Sharon is down there with you. That's true. Fantastic. So, what Sharon is saying is true. I spent a lot of time with Paul Solomon when nobody else was looking. Uh, part of my job was traveling around with him as a personal assistant. Um, and, you know, we spent a lot more time off the stage than on the stage. So he would take me around sometimes uh, to places in Texas where he had grown up and tell me stories about uh, what it was like for him there. Got to visit his home in Texarkana where his parents lived. Uh, I even got to visit Manly Palmer Hall with him and, and go to Manly Palmer Hall's wife and have tea with his, uh, with, with, with his uh, wife, Marie Hall. Got to go to his, um, his teacher, uh, Felton Jones, bonsai uh, collection in, in his home. So I got to see Paul when the cameras weren't on. And to me, those experiences were so much more, on the one hand, they were both a blessing and a curse, but they taught me so much more about what made him extraordinary as a human being, because these are all things that anybody could do, you know, without having to be psychic or having studied ancient wisdom teachings or like looking like the reincarnation of Moses coming down, you know, with the hair and the beard and the deep voice and all of that. But the strange thing is that I began my experience of uh, Paul by feeling sorry for him. Uh, as Sharon said, uh, my dad brought me down to Virginia Beach. He was actually on his way to conduct a leadership training program for IBM in Mechanicsburg, Virginia. And he dropped me off. He brought me down there because he wanted to get me out of the house. And what we saw was Paul do a worship service and then walk right by us out the door on his way to a four week uh, lecture tour. On the evening that Paul returned, a group of about 30 people greeted Paul at a reception at the Fellowship Center, which was then on Laskin Road in Virginia Beach. 
and they were expecting to hear him talk about you know, all the wonderful things that happened on the trip and everyone's so excited. But all I saw was a guy who was exhausted. I thought, well, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to be loving and serving one another? Why does anybody helping this guy out? I mean, this man needs to go home and rest. But you know, he took it all in and sat down and gave the group an inspiring talk. I think maybe it was the first time I was more interested in understanding the, mind, the man behind the lectures than sitting in on the lectures. And I had a lot of those moments behind the lectures. There's one thing I think a lot of people thought about Paul that was kind of frustrating for them. He, he would sometimes do this thing where he would do what I say, not what I do. Um, and, and actually early on in my relationship working with him, he said, you should learn at least as much from my mistakes as from what I teach. Not that he should learn from his mistakes, I should learn from his mistakes. And, and this was actually in line with another uh, teaching principle that he often shared with students. He would say, look, don't judge the value of what I teach by whether I'm the perfect example. And my understanding of what he was trying to say is, hey, you know, maybe you can do better at this, at, at applying these teachings than I can. But a lot of people didn't like this about him and, and had a tendency to think that his teaching was only valid if he lived it according to you know, their high standards. And like one example I'm, I'm sure a lot of people know about, a lot of people complained that he taught everyone to have a healthy diet, but he ate lots of sugar and meat. You know, during retreat programs, we'd serve all this healthy food and he would eat it and then wake me up at 2 a.m. to go out to the diner for sausage and eggs and gravy, lots of gravy. And you know, Paul's response to that was, look, if you want to have my health problems, you are welcome to eat the way I eat. If you want to be healthy, don't do what I do. And I always thought, that was probably the best part of his teaching about how to make people responsible for their own experience. Not just saying it, you know, he said, go ahead, you know, do whatever and deal with the results. Rob Pennington, he shared this story with me. He had an interesting interaction very early in Rob's relationship with Paul. At a conference of probably about 100, 150 people, Paul was talking about the importance and stages in growing spiritually. And Rob asked, so where are you along that path? Instant silence in the room. And you know, Paul kind of paused and he said, well, Rob, for, for what purpose do you ask this question? Rob said, well, if I like your answer, I'll believe you more. Silence in the room, he dared to what seems like challenging the teacher. Paul answered, truth is not dependent on the source from which it comes. And Rob thought, that, that's a pretty good answer. Thank you, and sat down. Now, it, I think a lot of other people in the audience were thinking Robert Pennington, PhD psychologist, was being cute with Paul. It kind of came across to at least some people as, why should I believe anything you say unless you're highly evolved? You know, whether Rob meant it or that way or not. So it's like Paul's put in this position of either elevating himself and so seeming haughty in comparison to others, or kind of dismissing his teachings by admitting that he's not highly evolved. Paul didn't take the bait, but he also didn't slam Rob for it and didn't act defensively. He gave Rob an answer that Rob probably didn't expect. He's basically saying, Look, whether I teach is the truth has nothing to do with what you believe. Actually, it has nothing to do with what I believe. It's either the truth or it's not the truth. And it's up to you to perceive it or not. He did that in a room full of people who were probably a lot of them at that time busy making negative judgments about how Paul, uh, how Rob was responding to Paul. And there was like so much in that one line and how Paul delivered it. He was letting people know. You can learn great truths from the most educated person whom you may judge to be less evolved. And it was pretty clear that the amount of insight or learning that anybody got from that had more to do with each person 
and not how uh, spiritually elevated Rob was or Paul was or not. And I kind of wonder how many of us at that time were able to get rid of our judgments about Rob and hear the point Paul was making about us. And, and Paul did another thing that would very often get on people's nerves. And it really pissed him off that people would project their expectations of what a spiritual teacher or a spiritual person should be like. Because, you know, here he is trying to teach people not to be judgmental. And while they're judging him for how he lives his life so that they can decide whether to listen to his teachings about how not to be judgmental. Wrap your mind around that one. That's amazing how we can do that. So sometimes he would do things deliberately to be contrary to what people expected of him, just to like break through those erroneous beliefs and judgments. You came to him with a specific idea of what a spiritual teacher should or shouldn't do. He would deliberately be contrary to that, just to make a point. And some of you know this one, uh, probably the the funniest example of this. When Tara Singh came to the fellowship, he had very strong beliefs that being a vegetarian made you more spiritual. So one of Paul's favorite things was to take Tara to breakfast or lunch at McDonald's. I never remember Paul taking Tara to an Indian restaurant. And I'll tell you, no one needed humble pie more than Tara Singh. Anybody else who knew this, who's here, who knew him would know that. And you know, he would do these things. Sometimes I'd, I'd think, is Paul just messing with me here? He would do things that didn't seem to make sense. Um, and eventually, I hopefully would learn that there was a method behind what he was doing. Like what, when I came to the fellowship, I felt extremely inadequate in many ways, but especially being in front of a group. I knew I would come across like a fool and people would laugh at me. So at one of our large events, there's like more than 100 people there. Paul created a little comedy routine for me to do with him. He wrote scripts for us to memorize, scripts which were like basically roasting various people in the audience in a light, you know, fun kind of way. In the script, I was the dummy and he was the ventriloquist. I would be carried into the room as this wooden dummy and placed on his lap. He would like set me up and speak through me, so to speak, talk through me, so to speak. He, and I don't know if you got this one. He's basically roasting his own reputation as psychic by doing this. He's talking through me. So here I am going into this already feeling like a fool in front of everybody. And he literally puts me on his lap to play the role of a dummy. At, at the time, a friend of mine thought he was being cruel to me and sure felt that way to me. But he knew enough about me to know I would push myself through it in spite of my embarrassment. But here's the trick. He wrote the scripts in such a way that I had all the punchlines. We actually, I don't know if any of you remember this, we literally performed the Who's On First routine from Abbott and Costello. And I didn't understand until later that he wrote the scripts in such a way that he actually came across as the dummy and I was the funny one, the smart ass. And I started to actually feel comfortable in front of people acting a role and being playful. And over the years, he devised like other ways of kind of driving me toward this goal because he saw in me a potential that my fears kept me from reaching. He, um, some of you remember this one. He had a group of us perform these revivalist sermons from God's trombones. I wanted the comic version. I wanted, I can do funny really good. He gave me the crucifixion scene. Oh, I had to learn how to feel and express passion and pathos and pain and focus it to deliver a message to the group. It was not funny. <laughs> But by doing these things, I eventually actually learned to be comfortable not only playing a role, but 
just like be myself. That took a long time. And it was extremely difficult, but I, sometimes I think I may not have been willing to push myself through those fears without his push behind me. And one thing that I've always thought about Paul, because of time that I spent with him when others were not around, you know, this, this question is, was Paul psychic or was it something else? I always thought it was kind of ironic that he had me be the conductor for his readings because that's not what my interest was. I wasn't really drawn to that. And some of you may even, Grace, Sharon, you'd probably be more familiar with, the, there was a quote in one of his readings that said something like, this channel does not need to communicate his wisdom through these readings, basically. And, and I just thought it was kind of ironic. People are hearing the source say that they could believe him when he's not being unconscious, but he couldn't just tell them that. And I remember this one time somebody came to Paul for a reading. And part of my job at that time was to work with the person to help prepare and to draft their questions that uh, they would ask him. And after I did this, I sat down with Paul to review the questions. And I said, Paul, you don't need to do a reading to help this person. You just, we know this, you just sit down and tell them this, 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 and this. We know this. The look on Paul's. I still get upset when I think about this. What he said was, but they won't believe me unless I lie down and close my eyes and they think it's not me saying. And the reading said exactly what you know we're talking about. And I just thought that was so sad. You know, from my experiences of being with Paul, you know, behind the scenes, as he would prepare to counsel people, do readings for them, I developed my belief about what it is to be a psychic, to be a healer, to have any of these other extrasensory abilities that people marveled at in him. And, and yet maybe I'm picking and choosing from my own beliefs. I'm, I'm aware of that. He taught that the most important thing you needed to be a healer was the ability to sincerely care. He taught that you know, to be psychic, you had to care more about the other person's needs than your own. And if you weren't willing to serve their most basic needs, which you, know, you may have thought were kind of petty, you couldn't be sensitive to their more subtle needs without just trying to make yourself sound smart, you know? And he tried to teach, it's not about you being smart or you being right or you being insightful. The psychic or the counselor or the healer is about the other person and their needs and whatever is the next step they're capable of taking, not what you might think. So, I kind of developed the belief that although Paul could sometimes be the biggest pain in the ass at times, he was at the same time the most sincerely pers caring person I'd ever met. And that's what I think it takes to be what people call psychic. Where the message comes from doesn't matter. And if the message is true, really, it's entirely up to the recipient to figure that out not to the person who's giving it. At least that's what I understood he was teaching. And, and this whole thing about serving, you know, many of you know that a, a theme in Paul's teachings is about the path of service. You know, are you capable setting aside your physical wants and needs to attend to somebody else's? You know, can you rise above your emotional reactions to attend to the reactions of uh, so that are overwhelming somebody else? Or can you see through your own judgments to perceive a key that will unlock a person that's kind of trapped in their own internal prison? You know, he could weave entirely inspiring talks that made people think they wanted to do it. Doing it was something entirely different. And I, I think a lot of you probably uh, remember one part of some of our month long retreat programs was serving another person. For two weeks, you would serve somebody else to take care of all their needs while they're focused on learning what's being taught. 
you do their laundry, you get their coffee, their tea, their meals, you clean their dishes, uh, anything, you, you take their notes for them, anything you can think of to focus on that person instead of what you just paid a couple thousand dollars for <laughs> to come and learn spiritual teachings. And then you switch roles and be served. Any idea which side of this was the most challenging? I'll tell you how I learned. Um, so by this time, you know, I've been doing this role with Paul for many years, day after day. It became who I was, my self in it, what everybody knew I was successful at doing. So one day, Paul decided we would switch roles and he would serve me. Yeah, y'all probably didn't know this. <laughs> yeah, and I resisted. Oh, no, no, I, we, we can't do this. No, no, no. But he was a boss. We did it. And I'm telling you, it was weird. It was freaky. I'm not going to go into all the detail of it with you, but I couldn't stand it. I realized I am not willing to make myself so vulnerable to somebody else by letting them inside with my insecurities and wants and the, and the needs that I've got. It was, it was too much for me. And I thought, this is what he'd been doing with me for so many years, letting me in like that. I thought I was the one who was helping him. So who was really serving whom? And it was, it, was, it was a difficult thing for me to admit that to myself. I'm not willing to let somebody into my life like that. When I thought I was the servant guy. And so there's another one, kind of along the path of service. Uh, uh, everybody has had questions in, in their mind about him with this. Was Paul a terrible manager or was there a method to his madness? So I'm just giving you a moment there to bring up your beliefs about that. See, I think we all got this wrong. Paul ran one of the most inefficient, ineffective nonprofit organizations ever, while still reaching tens of thousands of people around the world in very meaningful ways. And he was constantly and accurately being criticized for this by many well-meaning, successful business people who would regularly try to take control away from him so that his mission could be more successful. So were they right? Mission could have been more successful. <laughs> or should he have changed his management practices in order to reach more people more effectively? Or were they wrong? Was there a method to his madness? I, I think there's an, another way to look at it. Yeah, and I, I got a business degree. I went to school. Um, the stated purpose of a business is to help its stakeholders succeed. So you should hire and train and develop the best people to achieve the stated goals. Management 101. But what if that's not the purpose of your organization? You know, Paul was always very clear that Life is a mystery school, and the purpose is for each of us to learn our unlearned lessons. So his purpose was to help the people who came to him to do just that. He, he would not find the most fully qualified person to fill a job. He would find a person who needed to learn from doing that job. For example... She's listening, so I'm going to talk about her. He tasked Murr, then Murr Keaton, now Murr Haslam, a young woman with a background in theater and dance with the responsibility to publish and mail a huge monthly newsletter which involved highly technical knowledge and skills of pre-computer typesetting, editing, coordinating with many contributors to meet publication deadlines, Many people thought she was the least capable person of doing this. But we didn't see the artistic potential, the ability to work with others in an encouraging and inviting way, the persistence to keep on pushing until she got the job done, which I have since learned. And along with the need for her to learn structure and detail and organization, professional publishers 
have seen the newsletters that she published and have been impressed with how she was able to do this so regularly. So I won't just talk about her example. I'll tell you some of my screw ups. Um, really dumb things I did when I was his traveling assistant. On my first trip with Paul, he was already in New York City. So I drove up from Virginia Beach to meet him and then take him to the home of his good friend, Dr. William Kelly, where we would be staying and he'd be conducting uh, some classes. Now, Paul knew that part of my responsibility was getting us from place to place and on time with everything that we needed. I knew he had been to Bill's before, so I figured he knew how to get there. Can you see this coming? After driving out of New York City and getting onto the New Jersey Turnpike, he quietly asked me, do you know where we're going? I had no idea. I panicked. I started looking at the map to try to figure it out. How am I going to find it on the map? I don't even know what the address is. I didn't know where to go. And uh, of course, you know, I, I kind of knew he was just jerking me around at the time, pointing out to me, hey, it's your responsibility to handle every bit of logistics around everything not to leave it to him or to anybody else. It took me a long time to learn that lesson. While I'm falling into an anxiety fit, because I didn't know how to figure this out, he reached over and he stuck his finger in my ear, just to be goofy, because he got a kick out of how soft my ears were. And I knew he was trying to help me, you know, let me off the hook, help me calm down. Just this little bit of personal goofiness at the same time he's challenging me to deal with something that i should have known already it took me a long time and, and other examples of this um by the way uh i know nobody knew this one uh i was so scared of him at this point and and, and always so serious around him paul decided to loosen me up so when we stayed at uh, Bill Kelly's house, I'd never had any alcohol, couldn't stand the taste. I've overcome that deficiency now. So they made pina coladas and got me absolutely crazy drunk. I think Mer, only, only Mer and Rob have ever seen me that loose. But somehow after that, I could joke with him in a friendly way that surprised the hell out of everybody <laughs> when we returned to Virginia Beach. You know, what happened to Stephen? Well, you know, we got him drunk. Loosened him up. Another example, uh, you know, part of my job, traveling assistant, packed the clothes, the toiletries, everything that we needed for our, uh, our, for lectures and media appearances. I had never taken care of good quality suits. I arrived in Virginia Beach in yoga pants and a backpack with a bag of nuts and raisins. I didn't have the experience required of an executive assistant for an international speaker, but he put me in charge of a very important part of his public and professional image. So we take this trip to Australia. It was exhausting. So when we arrived, I told our hosts right away, we need to get him to his hotel so he can eat and rest. And they said, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. We have a TV interview set up. We've got to go straight immediately to the TV station. He didn't complain to them. He said to me, I didn't fly all the way to Australia to just eat and sleep. I came here to do this, so let's go. We get to the TV station. I open the suitcase. And I found that the shampoo had spilled all over his clothes, everything was a mess. Did he blast me? No, not a word. Did he tell them it was my fault in order to save face for himself? No, didn't mention it. He wore that suit with pride as if it was perfect. And I think because of the way he wore it, he looked great. People had more respect for him because of the way he acted under the circumstance. I sure did. And boy, I never made that mistake again. And maybe the biggest, I don't know if this is the biggest, but it, it's up there, mistake that I made. Years later, um, 
I would have been fired from any real business for doing this. Paul had somehow arranged to have a $365 monthly payment uh, for in the contract for our Hearth Fire Lodge Retreat Center. The owner self-financed it. So we're just sending this guy $365 a month that we'd be paying just about forever. And he wanted to foreclose. He wanted to get out of that contract. The way our bank account was set up, we required two signatures for any check over a certain amount. And at one point, I just neglected to get the second signature before I put the check in the mail. The man immediately foreclosed. He wanted a payment of hundreds of thousands in full or we forfeit our long investment. Too late to make a long story short, Paul convinced him to take a huge down payment. I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 30, $40,000, something like that. And in the future, we would pay $1,000 a month with another big balloon payment down the road. Just totally changed our financial picture. We drove two hours, signed the new contract. Did Paul rant and rave about how stupid and irresponsible and damaging I had been? Not a word. Did he tell the guy it was my fault in order to you know, use me as leverage to get a deal? No. He did make sure I made that quiet drive with him. No, <laughs> that was a long, silent drive. And so he didn't always choose the most qualified person. I sure wasn't. Once after doing a healing service in Canada, Paul was approached by a man who invited him out to dinner by saying, you have the talent and the message that, and I have the resources to make you into an international superstar. He told him you could reach millions and be the next spiritual Tony Robbins. This man was the business genius who had been sponsoring professional wrestling for years back in the 1980s. He would research potential cities, that were good markets, he'd go in, he would buy a local radio and TV station. He'd buy a local newspaper. He would advertise free for months. He would rent the largest facility in the county and then run events for a, a couple of months, making millions before they left town for the next city when they would sell the radio station, the TV station, and the newspapers for a profit. I mean, this was multi-million dollar business. The man told Paul, you will have complete control over the content of what you teach, but you'll leave all business decisions to me. You'll go where I tell you to go. You'll show up on time. You'll do your thing. I'll handle everything else. On the ride back to our room, I had never seen Paul's so quiet and pensive. So I asked him, what are you going to do? Paul knew the man could succeed. But he said he realized he couldn't accept the offer because the way the gentleman would run the organization wouldn't be in line with his teaching, even though it would be more successful at reaching more people. So was Paul right and the business experts wrong or was it the other way around? I think both choices are wrong, are the, just the wrong way to look at it. Paul was running an organization with a purpose that was different from a typical business or even the typical nonprofit enterprise. His goal was to have a place where people could come and learn to overcome their unlearned lessons, expand their potential and welcome others who needed to do the same and learn how not to be judgmental about them. Sure, you know, he conducted classes and taught ideas and techniques, but the real learning comes in real life application, not in the classroom, and he knew that. He created opportunities for people to step up as far as they could, and then it was, you know, like up to us to go as far as we would choose to go. To me, that made Paul the greatest person and teacher, what made him the greatest person and teacher, that he would continue working with people who sincerely wanted to continue working on themselves, which is why I kept being there, no matter how many times they screwed up. He literally gave his vision, his organization into their hands, 
and he let them either succeed or fail with it. And he'd pick them back up when they fell flat. So I kind of judge his success or failure more by what his values and purpose were rather than the way a business is typically organized. And, you know, one thing I think all of us know about Paul, he was complicated, <laughs> just like the rest of us. And to me, that's what makes his teaching so valuable you know, when, when he says, you can do all these things I have done and more. It's more meaningful because he was a real person uh, just like us. And I, I, I think I have to say most of my other stories are only suitable for late night after a few glasses of wine. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, let's all give uh, let's all give Stephen a big round of applause. <laughs> like someone was saying, it brought back a lot of memories of a lot of adventures that many of us had with Stephen here at this church back in the mainly in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So thank you, Stephen, for a wonderful talk. Um, I'd like to take a moment to um, for all of us to give a big Thank you to uh, Stephen Poplin and to Sharon Solomon for all the work they have done to make this, this weekend possible. Let's give them a <laughs>